Good evening. Uh, I'm Molly Rosenberg, Director of the Royal Society of Literature, uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the last of this year's Dalloway Day discussions celebrating Virginia Woolf's life and work. Tonight, we'll be marking 100 years of Woolf's only short story collection, Monday or Tuesday, with an exploration of, her, of the short fiction that she wrote and the relationship between two of modernism's finest writers, Catherine Mansfield and Virginia Woolf. We're delighted this evening to be in the good company of our partners, the British Library, who hold extensive collections on Woolf and Mansfield. Links to these, including manuscripts and articles, calls are all available on the event page on the British Library website so that you can keep Dalloway Day going for weeks to come. What more could you want? Uh, before you dive into those, I'll introduce our chair for this evening's conversation, RSL fellow, novelist and short story writer, Irena Sunakoji. Irenison's debut novel, Butterfly Fish, won a Betty Trask Award, and her short stories have been published internationally, with her collection Speak Gigantula shortlisted for the Edge Hill Short Story Prize, the Jalak Prize, and the Saboteur Awards, and nominated for a Shirley Jackson Award. Last week, she was made MBE for her services to literature. Thank you so much, Irenison. Over to you. Thank you so much, Molly. Um, I'm thrilled to be here moderating this panel. Um, it's a wonderful event in partnership with the RSL and the British Library, celebrating the fascinating, complicated friendship between two great writers, Virginia Woolf and Catherine Mansfield. Joining me to discuss this are three brilliant authors, Emily Midorikawa, Emma Claire Sweeney and Kirsty Gunn. If you have questions for the writers, please do post them. I'll get to them later. In the meantime, I'd like to introduce our guests without further ado. Kirsty Gunn won the Edge Hill Prize for short stories for her collection, Infidelities, and is a patron of the International Catherine Mansfield Society. Emily Midorikawa is the author of Out of the Shadows, Six Visionary Victorian Women in Search of a Public Voice. She co-authored with Emma Claire Sweeney, A Secret Sisterhood, The Hidden Friendships of Austen, Bronte, Elliot and Wolf. Emily won the Lucy Cavendish Fiction Prize and has written for The Telegraph, The Paris Review and The Washington Post. Emma Claire Sweeney is the author of award-winning novel, Our Song at Dawn and co-author with Emily Madorakawa of A Secret Sisterhood, The Hidden Friendships of Austen, Bronte, Elliot and Wolf, a recipient of Arts Council, Royal Literary Fund and Society of Authors Awards. Emma is a lecturer at the Open University where her research focuses on Virginia Woolf. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. I'm thrilled to be in conversation with you. Um, reading the stories of both Woolf and Mansfield, what struck me is that in modernist fashion, they are character driven rather than plot driven. They're kind of quiet measured stories about small moments that build to an epiphany, often set within the domestic, often looking at women and their internal desires, as well as the external issues they have to navigate. Um, they're fascinating, beautifully crafted stories. Um, I wondered, um, when did you first discover that they were actually friends and what struck you about the differences uh, and similarities in terms of their work? I'm gonna ask each of you, but come to Emily first. Thank you. Um, so Emma and Guy became interested in the subject of female literary friendship actually quite a number of years ago now. Um, we started by uh, writing feature articles on the subject and we were running a literary blog that was looking at um, yeah, female literary friends. I think both Emma and I initially actually made the mistake of thinking that Wolf and Mansfield were not friends at all. We knew there was a connection between them, but we saw them perhaps more as enemies actually, rather than friends. And I think probably the reason for that is um, some of the things that they said about each other, you know, well-recorded things they said about each other during uh, their lifetimes do not sound like the comments of a good friend to another just to sort of give you an example um wolf once likened uh, her friend Catherine Mansfield to a civic cat that has taken to street walking and um you know that, that is just one example of of, of quite a number of, of choice quotes like that I think though you know, because these quotes of 
often taken a little bit out of context. Um, uh, they're often quoted in essays perhaps or articles that don't really give like a full picture of what these women had said to each other. I think the, and because they're so quotable, they're so, they're so like funny, they're so interesting. These kinds of um, yeah, comments have overshadowed, traditionally overshadowed, focus on, on the complex, but certainly close literary friendship between these two. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're such barbed comments, aren't they? That they just, <laughs> they just intrigue you. Uh, you wonder how do they recover from that <laughs> in terms of their friendship and reconcile uh, and still be able to so support each other's work and voices. Um, Emma, I want to come to you next. Yeah, I, I think that they actually were very good, or certainly Wolf was very good at accommodating rivalry within the friendship. Um, so it was an extremely fraught relationship. Uh, there's no denying that. Uh, but I think the rivalry was something that was useful to them. Um, so Wolf could see that Mansfield could do things that she couldn't do. And, and she acknowledged that she was jealous of that. Um, but I think that spurred her on uh, to try to up her game in her own writing. Um, so for instance, um, in Prelude, which obviously um, uh, uh, Wolf published through Hogarth Press uh, with Leonard, um, she massively admired that story. And I think something that Mansfield does so cleverly in Prelude is obviously bring together those small quiet moments of life and the rich sensory detail that take us to the Wellington home. Uh, but also she has the power of silence in that story. Of what is this a prelude to? Uh, what, what's going to happen next that will disrupt this childhood Idol, and we have all these sort of sinister notes in that story that give us a sense of the unspoken, which of course is the Great War, which we know as readers was about to happen. And I think that pushed Wolf to challenge herself to write about the political, um, to write about terrain that might have been considered um, traditionally masculine. And in her future work, she went on to, to write about the war in this kind of slant way that perhaps she learned from Mansfield. Yeah, and Kirsty, how about you? And not, only to, and not only to write about that war, but to write differently, because I think what's so beautiful about this relationship between these two, as Molly said at the beginning, key writers of the 20th century, is that they were after something so different. Both of them were throwing off an enormously weighty tradition. Both of them uh, were surrounded by male hegemonies of what constituted proper literature, how society was constituted, how the war itself was viewed, all of these things. They were two women, they were outsiders, they came into the center of literary activity and they forged a new kind of story. I think Emily, Emily and Emma are absolutely right to remind us that much has been made in biography and, and the press and so on, about this being some kind of rancorous, vicious rivalry. No doubt, as we all know, all of us who are writers are always interested in the works of other writers. But as Vincent O'Sullivan, the um, terrific you know, international wolf scholar, and of course who edited the collected letters, tells us this was something like friendship. You know, <laughs> at the end of the day, this was two women who were working hard and professionally on their craft. And they knew that they could learn a great deal from each other and would. And I think that all of our, the wealth of critical material that we have around this relationship, um, I think of Angela Smith's beautiful Public of Two, I think of the amazing collected stories of Mansfield that Jerry Kimber and Vincent O'Sullivan have put together, I think of the work of Claire Han Hansen and David Bradshaw. All of this work gives us a picture of two women who are at the top of their game and absolutely using and being inspired by each other, nourishing each other to give us a new kind of fiction. Yeah, they, yes. certainly, they certainly seem like fierce women, but also rivals in the best 
sense of the word that you know because you you inspire each other you support each other you read each other's work and feedback so I love that element um, about their friendship when they actually first met Mansfield was the more prolific um, you know writing short stories writing poetry um, really becoming a great force in her own right um, what drew you to her her work Kirsty and how has it influenced your fiction well, you're quite right. I mean, Mansfield had been writing short stories for a very long time and publishing way before 1921, when we have Wolf's Monday or Tuesday that we're celebrating here tonight. Her mm. first collection um, in a German pension sold out like it was a massive, it was a big deal at the time. And in fact, throughout her life, her publishers were pestering her to re have that reprinted. She herself set it to one side. You know, she'd moved on to to much more interesting things. And she dismissed those early stories as being a kind of form of caricature. But yeah, I mean, I came to both of these writers very early. I was lucky enough to be uh, drip fed Catherine Mansfield as a child, have, growing up in New Zealand. And from that very quickly, I uh, developed a reading relationship with Wolf as well. So to read those two writers alongside each other and kind of take it for granted um, in one's teenage years, feels like a mighty gift. Absolutely. Um, just thinking about Mrs. Dalloway, um, which was actually a, um, a short story in its first iteration, um, that absolutely makes sense to me as a short story writer, that it would then develop into a novel because you have so much more to say, you want to give that character much more dimension and much more space. Um, I wondered if each of you could talk about um, your ideas around the relationship or connections between short stories um, and novels. I'll come to Emily first. Yeah, I think it's, it's a really interesting question. I think with that particular um, Wolf short story, Mrs. Dalloway in, in Bond Street, um, it can be read as a short story that can be enjoyed on its own terms. Um, obviously, to read it now, you, you know that it became a very, very well-known novel. So it's actually a little bit hard to sort of, you know, put your, yourself into the, into the mindset of someone who perhaps encountered the story for the first time when it came out. But um, I... <laughs> I still think there's something about that story, although it does work on its own terms, that does cry out for greater expansion. You know, as I say, I am coming from this from the period of knowing it is a novel as well, or the beginning of a novel, although obviously there are differences between the start of Mrs. Dalloway and, and that short story. Um, I think it's quite interesting to compare a story like that to some of Wolf's other stories that have a, a more, perhaps like a more complete feel to them. And also some of Catherine Mansfield's stories as well. Um, I mean, if we think of something like The Garden Party, you know, obviously Mansfield could have written, you know, a, a full novel about these characters. And certainly when that story ends, you do have this feeling in your mind that you haven't, you know, not everything has been revealed to you. And the story, the characters keep working in your mind. You wonder what's going to happen next. But I do think... Mansfield, to me, really does feel like a natural short story writer in the sense that although there's always so much more to say and so much more to come back to with her stories because they do change on reading after reading, they do actually tend to feel really perfect in that form. I, I rarely read a story by Mansfield that I think oh, this would have worked better as a longer piece of work. I don't know what other people think about that, but um, that's certainly my feeling with, with her, her best works. Yeah, her stories also have, I think, a lovely quiet tension. Um, so much of it is also about what's not said, you know, the, the secret or silent desires of women um, yeah. and the idea of fulfilment and what that looks like and how you process it or how you even articulate it. I love that she's able to explore that um, in, in some of her brilliant stories. So uh, I agree. I think she's an excellent um, short story writer. Yeah. yeah, I think actually this quality of so much being unsaid is, is one of the things that draws you back to these stories again and again. You don't really read them like, oh, what's gonna happen next? Mm. Um, you know, the story is not spoilt by knowing the ending of it. You know, you, you come back to it differently every time. I think read like all good um, short stories, but also works of literature. If you read these stories at different stages in your life, your take on them as well is quite different. Yeah, absolutely. Emma, I'll come to you next. Yeah, I, I was thinking about the fact that perhaps 
Mansfield's real focus on the short story and Wolf's um, sort of great achievements in the novel was perhaps a way that they could accommodate their differences and their mutual talents. So when Mansfield reviewed Night and Day, Virginia Woolf's second novel, she actually gave it a really quite scathing review um, in some ways. At one point she said that uh, reading the novel made one feel old and chill. And in order to sort of process that criticism when it was still quite raw, um, Wolf kind of wrote it off by saying, oh, the review shows that Mansfield isn't interested in novels. Um, so she tried to make that differentiation. And then when uh, they managed to kind of come to some sort of uneasy understanding about that review, uh, through Mansfield, eventually explaining to Wolf what her problem with the novel was. And the problem was that it didn't acknowledge the First World War. Not mm. just in content, but as Kirsty was mentioning earlier, really, I think mostly her problem was about the form. The form of the novel hadn't sufficiently changed to accommodate these great changes that have been wrought in the world. Um, and then once Wolf understood that, that seemed to be a message that then filtered into so much of her work subsequently, uh, her stories and her novels. Um, so very clearly uh, in novels like Mrs. Dalloway, where we have um, someone suffering from shell shock, um, but also into the lighthouse when a family is ripped apart by, by the war. Um, but I think it affected her stories too. So when they did come to this sort of understanding about the reason why Mansfield had a problem with the novel, Mansfield actually commissioned Wolf to write a short story uh, for the Athenaeum, which um, Mansfield's husband was editing. And Wolf replied by saying, oh, I don't think I can write stories. And Mansfield said, nobody can write stories other than you. Now, she was, you know, that was flattery. <laughs> Mansfield <laughs> knew full well that uh, she could write stories um, supremely well herself. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think this, this difference in form allowed them to learn from each other in a way that perhaps didn't feel directly competitive. And, and I think Mansfield felt very envious of Wolf actually for the time and ease that she perceived Wolf having, that she perceived as allowing her to write these longer forms. So she talked about, you know, of course Wolf can, can write these novels because she's in her own house, surrounded by <laughs> her own possessions, with her husband within call. And certainly Wolf did have this sort of ordered life around her, partly facilitated by her husband, that I think Mansfield both despised and craved. Yeah, I mean, I could only imagine how much more competitive the relationship would have been had they been operating in the same form. Um, and actually, after that scathing cr um, critique, um, there was a, t a period of time that passed before they reconciled. And when they were able to reconcile, um, you know, the feedback um, that she received um, from Mansfield actually helped her to become a better writer. So when she was able to take it on board and process it, um, it's interesting that she went on to write amazing novels. So so, um, you know, that relationship proved to be very uh, useful um, for Wolf. Uh, Gersti, I want to come to you next. Yes, well, I just want to um, go back to em Emma's very important point that, you know, there are there are absolutely links between the two forms. And we see that in the working relationship of these two women. You know, it's a question of timeline, too, because obviously Mansfield's life is short. Now, we know in that short life she had plans absolutely to write a novel. She could imagine the novel. She had a feeling of the sense of it. She knew the kind of thing it was going to be. Um, as Emily said, she'd already been thinking about how some of those stories, Prelude at the Bay and so on, the, this cast of characters might find a larger space to move around in. It was a question of time. She died in early 1923 before Wolf had started writing all of the amazing novels that we love. And her short story at the Bay is there into the lighthouse. And we can also see all kinds of parts of prelude sounding through the work of Wolf. There was no question that these women were richly creative influences upon each other. And had Mansfield lived, 
I think there is no doubt in scholars' minds, uh, going through the letters, going through the journals, that Mansfield would have written um, novels as well. And I think the other thing that's really interesting to think about here too, is the relationship between novel and short story for these two writers in particular, because we have writers engaged in the practice of a new kind of literature, a new kind of approach to telling stories that's not about, but is, that gives us a feeling, an impression, a sense of being there. As, as you yourself said at the beginning of Renaissance, this, fe this feeling of, of character, of the, the people being right up close and with us, that we live, up, that we live their lives with them. So all of these things can be in a short story and they can be in a novel. It's a question of making that novel in a different kind of way, piece by piece, fragment by fragment, and, shunt, and, and getting rid of, shunting off this enormous canonical sense of what the novel has been. Mm. Beautifully said, Kirsty. And, and that's exactly that I think the best way to approach writing a novel is looking at it as um, pieces of a puzzle. You know, I often think of it as interconnected shorts because I write short stories myself and that actually helped me write the novel. <laughs> Otherwise, I just felt so intimidated by the actual process of doing it. So it's about finding a way to get around it, I think, um, as a writer in a way that you can process it, that keeps it exciting, that keeps it dynamic. And every, every, every writer has a unique approach to that, I guess, in how, you know, how do you make something? You know, it, some of that process is actually really mysterious. When people ask me, well, how did you write the novel? It's, it's very difficult to just com completely fully articulate it. So it's an elusive, um, intriguing process, I think, but you articulated it really beautifully. Um, Emma, uh, Mansfield died in, in 1928, as Kirsty mentioned, but their, their friendship was so deep and profound, um, even though it was, a, you know, over a fairly short period of time. Why do you think their influence on each other has been um, somewhat overlooked? It's a good question. I think it's probably to do with the early days of um, Mansfield's posthumous memory. Uh, so her husband, John Middleton Murray, um, edited her letters and journal, and he was very keen to come across as the most important literary influence on his wife um, and the person to whom she turned um, in the most significant way. Um, he could let in the, some of the great Russian male writers too as being influencers. So obviously he acknowledged the influence of Chekhov. Um, but I think on the one hand, he, he perhaps felt that to uh, acknowledge Wolf's influence would be to diminish his own. Um, and secondly, I think, you know, clearly he had quite a complex relationship with Wolf himself. Um, you know, by, by the end of Wolf's life, she really had very little time for John Middleton Murray, and I, I suspect the feelings were mutual. Uh, so there might have been some kind of personal reason for him wanting to kind of write her out. Um, mm -hmm. And then once Wolf died, um, you know, uh, her early biographies, um, Quentin Bell, for instance, her nephew, uh, he pretty much dismissed the influence and um, basically saying that you know, Wolf thought of Mansfield as a bit of a tart, <laughs> um, which on the one hand, you know, plenty of the comments she made about her um, could sort of uh, give him that impression. You know, he said um, he probably thought of Wolf saying that she'd gone all sorts of hog by the time she was 17. Um, but I think that failed to really acknowledge the complexity of that fascination that Wolf was actually fascinated by Mansfield's sexual history. I think fascinated and at some points truly disgusted, but in a way that was perhaps creatively rich by some of the portrayal of sexuality in Mansfield's work and female desire. And I think it probably tapped into some, at that point, sort of quite unarticulated aspects of Wolf's life, um, which she later went on to express somewhat in her um, relationships, but also more importantly, I think in her writing and I do think that, you know, obviously we've had amazing biographers like Claire Tomlin and Hermione Lee, who from the 1980s onwards have been bringing this relationship to light and been acknowledging the, the huge influence. And you really have to really be
be quite studious um, in your uh, attempts to ignore the influence uh, because it, it, it's so clear. I think if you look at a story like The Garden Party where you know the death of a lower class man kind of disrupts this more this higher class party and then you see a novel like Mrs Dalloway where exactly the same scenario occurs and this happens time and again with themes that uh, Mansfield explores in her stories then emerging later in Wolf's novels. Brilliant yeah and I think also Mansfield was several years younger than Wolf, and perhaps that played an element um, in terms of her interest in her, you know, as the slightly more youthful character brimming with interesting ideas, exploring sexuality and exciting themes. So um, there seemed to be a kind of mutual intrigue um, between the two of them. Um, Emily, uh, they're often portrayed as enemies, uh, and that's really interesting. Uh, this is something that we see over and over again, uh, women who, you know, have a similar passion being pitted against each other. Um, why is that? Is, the, is it just that it makes it culturally more exciting for the audiences or the readers, you know, to be more drawn to their work? There's some idea or reason behind it, but why do you think that is? Yeah, so, I mean, we should remember, of course, that this was a friendship that did have friction in it. We know that from some of the things that they said to each other, um, you know, some of the periods when they were not getting on so well and periods when they were apart and would, you know, feel quite insecure perhaps about how the other one felt. But I think, um, as I, we've all been talking about already, it was a genuine friendship that could accommodate rivalry and in fact could use rivalry as you know a fuel um to but creatively but it was also like kind of a, a maybe a personal driving force behind the relationship as well i think what you said though is, is really interesting i think we do still as a society uh, certainly in their day but i think still today really struggle um to accommodate ideas of um ambitious women being able to be friends. I think the stereotype of an ambitious woman is often, you know, someone who's trampling over all of her sisters to kind of get to her place at the top. And so I think the fact that these two clearly were intellectual women, they were ambitious, um, they were very committed to their art, almost, you know, it has made it so that it, 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 it's, it's their, their status in that sense, it's too easy, I think, to um, write them off as enemies straight away, just because yeah. of some of the stereotypes we have around ambitious women. And it's quite interesting. Emma and I talked about this quite a lot when we were writing in our book, A Secret Sisterhood, because um, when you think of the great male writing friendships, you know, Byron and Shelley, for instance, or Hemingway and Fitzgerald, um, rivalry or you know interesting bus stops is often you know that's often part of the mythology of those <laughs> friendships one of the things that people find interesting about them but I think in cases of a female friendship it's often much harder for people to wrap their head around that so these insults that they traded cannot be seen as part of an interesting creative relationship they're immediately written off as yeah just bitchy comments you know and um the relationship is downplayed because of that. Yeah, they're, so fabu they're like fabulously barbed comments, though, as well. <laughs> I think they're very, very funny. I'm not sure I would quite recover if my <laughs> one or two of my female author friends would, would say those things, but they were obviously made of tough stuff. So, Kirsty, you were going to um, add. Well, to... no, I was just going to add my voice to Emily's, and I'm so glad, um, you know, that we've raised this issue of, um, uh, of feminism. And the fact that we in inhabit, we still inhabit a culture whereby, yes, it's great fun and it gets a lot of traction to talk about women being ambitious, women seeing each other down, women wanting to beat each other at the post. And with that comes, of course, the absence of a literary female tradition, because instead of building up the great canonical uh, map of work, that is built piece by piece by one man standing on the shoulder of the one before, we instead get these so-called fragmentary moments, these moments of 
experimentation that then just simply dissolve on the landscape. So Wolf and Mansfield are an example of that so nearly happening. Um, as you said, Renzo, in your introduction to that question, it could have so easily been the case that um, due to gossip, due to certain kinds of mal malice, due to, yes, Milt Middleton Murray's desire to forge this kind of unreal uh, picture of his wife and her talent, all of these things could have meant that we didn't have, that we wouldn't be having the discussion we're having today about two women creating a new kind of literature. So we have to remind ourselves that this is something that we're still shamefully um, still getting our heads around. This idea that women will help other women, that women's writing will enclose more women's writing, that that's a circle that will enlarge and admit more and more members instead of this idea of individual acts of daring, genius, beauty, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've certainly been very encouraged by my um, female friendships. They are actually crucial, um, I think, in terms of my writing life. So um, I, I draw great inspiration from Wolf and Mansfield. And I think it's really important that we actually continue to have conversations about them, about their work and their friendship so that it doesn't get lost, you know, uh, in the way that these things do. Um, Emma, I want to come to you and just talk briefly about Prelude, which is Again, uh, a wonderful piece uh, about familial connections. Um, in it, Mansfield uses a family's move to talk about class and again, female desires. Um, and it's sort of, it's, it's a very measured piece, uh, but there's this kind of strange incorporation of bird symbolism within it as well, which makes it slightly, slightly striking and strange. Um, could you talk a little bit about Wolf's um, role in bringing that to the public's attention? Sure, yeah, so um, Wolf and her husband Leonard actually commissioned Catherine Mansfield uh, to write a short story um, for the Hogarth Press. And the Hogarth Press was their own press. They'd set it up partly to free Virginia Woolf from the pressures of being published by her half-brother, um, her stepbrother rather, who had actually sexually abused her as a child. Um, so it must have been an incredibly fraught dynamic um, being reliant on him to bring her work out into the world. Um, so when they set up their own press, initially they published um, a short story by each of them. Um, but when they wanted to branch out and publish a story by a, a new writer, they chose Catherine Mansfield and they didn't approach anybody else. Uh, so they were really taking a punt on her. I think it shows a great deal about Wolf's admiration for Mansfield. And, you know, Prelude is a long short story. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's sort of on the cusp of being a, a novella really. And given that Mansfield um, was being published by Wolf, who was hand setting the print, mm -hmm. literally every letter of Prelude, Wolf handled with her own hands, uh, placing them on the printer upside down, the wrong way round. You know, it's an incredibly laborious process. And Wolf turned down lots of invitations the summer that she was typesetting Prelude. Um, their mutual friend, Ottoline Morel, was trying to get her to go down to Garston Manor to parties. Um, and, and she was turning down those invitations to, to work on Prelude. Um, they also had a print run, which was double the print run that they'd had for their own stories. So they had a lot of faith in this story. Unfortunately, um, they made a few mistakes with the printing of it. Um, they had the title wrong on a few pages, for instance, um, and they didn't manage to get as much enthusiasm for the story as they'd hoped. So it wasn't particularly widely reviewed when it first came out. Um, and it, it didn't get the reception it deserved. I think people perhaps, people need time to learn how to read something that feels as new as that, as sometimes as long as generations, really. Um, so when it first came out, I think people thought, what, what is this? <laughs> and uh, people didn't understand what it was a prelude to. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the title prelude is actually one of the most brilliant things about that story um, because the title's really in conversation with the whole story. 
I think we're being encouraged to ask, what is this a prelude to? And, and as I suggested earlier, I think part of what it's a prelude to is the, the terrible violence and conflict that was about to be wrought on the world. Also on a more personal level, I think it's a prelude to adulthood and to an emerging sexuality. And, and there's all sorts of sinister, violent undertones in a story that in many ways is idyllic. Um, so when we have the, the slaughter of the bird at the end, I mean, there's, there's something so horrifying about that. Um, and I think that's about a sort of loss of innocence. Um, and I think all of these things Wolf did appreciate. So unlike many of their contemporaries, he said things like, well, it hardly sets the Thames on fire. Uh, Wolf defended it. Wolf said, no, this, this is a work of art. She understood that it was a work of art. Um, and so she put her body into this work <laughs> um, and, and she engaged with it intellectually with her mind. And I think it was a, a huge influence on her future work. But as Kirsty has been emphasizing, you know, they, they were both doing something incredibly new and it's hardly surprising that early readers didn't always understand what they were reading. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Mansfield was daring, like you said, in that she was straddling two forms almost with this short story almost being like a novella. Um, I think, I wonder whether that was intentional, um, but you know, it, it certainly makes it interesting as a form. Um, I also love and feel deeply touched by the fact that, you know, Wolf was typesetting and it, that's a labor of love to do that, you know, page after page after page. Um, it's, it's really beautiful actually. It makes me feel quite emotional um, thinking about their friendship and that, you know, even though it wasn't received very well, she staunchly defended it. She saw the subtle power of, of Mansfield's writing, um, which is amazing. Um, Emily, I want to come to you and just talk a little bit about Kew Gardens, um, which presents uh, an eclectic bunch of characters at Kew uh, and, and touches on themes of desire, loss, um, human connection. Uh, it has um, Wolf's uh, kind of stream of consciousness that we now know her for. Uh, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about Mansfield's influence on Kew Gardens. Yes, so Mansfield told Wolf that she thought Kew Gardens marked a turning point in Wolf's career, um, which can probably be taken in more than one way. Just to give you a bit of the background of the story, there was an occasion when um, Mansfield visited the home of Lady Ottilyn Morrill, um, who Emma was just talking about uh, a moment ago. She had this beautiful house, Garsington Manor, with these fantastic gardens. And we know that Mansfield was very taken with the gardens. She wandered around, you know, she uh, enjoyed collecting flowers that could be dried to make potpourri with. Um, you know, she was very taken by the scenery. She was also inspired by it in a literary sense as well. We know from a letter that she wrote to her hostess afterwards that she talked about um, being inspired by the gardens, you know, wondering who might one day write about those gardens. And she talked a little bit about, you know, a literary work that was coming to Sort of fruition in her mind um, where you would have couples wandering in and out of gardens and you'd have conversations coming in and out um, sort of like a, a conversation set to the music of flowers as it were so the flowers would be very much part of it the gardens would be very much part of it and then you know the, the conversations between these these different people coming in and out would, would be it yeah sort of flowing together with with the the gardens themselves um, we know that uh, that Mansfield also wrote to Wolf about um, her experience uh, of visiting the gardens because it was something that Wolf relayed back to Ottilyn Morrill afterwards. Um, we don't know this for certain because the letter no longer survives, but it seems likely perhaps that she mentioned some of these literary ideas to um, Wolf as well. 
Interestingly, sometime later, Wolf wrote a story, not set at Garsington Manor, it was set um, in Kew Gardens, as, 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 as you've just, just indicated. But there's marked similarities, I think, between what Mansfield had originally envisaged and this um, idea that Wolf actually brought to fruition. Um, so Emma and I talked quite a lot about when we were writing a secret sisterhood. We talked quite a lot about, you know, the possibility that perhaps Mansfield had heard this. Uh, sorry, Wolf had heard this idea from Mansfield and then sort of taken it for herself in a way. Um, and to go back to my my point about Mansfield saying this marked uh, turning point for Wolf in her literary career. That can obviously be seen as a great compliment, but it could also perhaps be some sort of an acknowledgement of the fact that in a way she may have felt that Wolf, um, yeah, took her idea and, 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 and uh, made it a, a literary form in a way that she, she didn't. I mean, at this time, Mansfield was already suffering from ill health. Um, she didn't have as much time to work on new ideas as she would have liked. Um, she certainly had the idea that Wolf had, you know, almost all the time in the world and was very supported, which in some ways she was, you know, her domestic setup was very different from that of Mansfield. So that's not to say that um, there weren't obstacles in Wolf's way as well. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you want to add something to this, Emma. I mean, I, guess it's, I mean, any of us who write know that uh, influence is a complex um, and, and tricky thing. Um, and I, I suppose uh, reading between the lines of these letters with all the omissions that, that exist, unusually actually, it was very unusual for there to be gaps in Wolf's letters. So it's even perhaps significant that this letter is missing. Um, we know that uh, Wolf had been thinking about Kew Gardens before this um, conversation with Mansfield. Um, she actually met Mansfield when she was recovering from um, an extremely uh, difficult period in her mental health. Uh, she'd had to have several mental nurses. She'd gone through what was then referred to as a nervous breakdown. Um, and, you know, she'd been extremely ill for a long time. And it was actually during that period of illness that she first had an idea of, of writing about a garden. Um, clearly, Mansfield and Wolf both shared great interest in gardens, you know, flowers and plants and the natural world come into both their work significantly. So we're not, we're not uh, claiming that this was the only influence on, on Wolf, on Wolf's Kew Gardens, but it, it seems in terms of looking at the timeline that perhaps uh, these conversations with um, Mansfield perhaps spurred her on um, and perhaps gave her a, a sense of how she might change the form in which she wrote. Um, so, you know, in Kew Gardens, I think some of the most striking things are the, uh, you know, the passages are written from the perspective of the snail, mm -hmm. for instance. And I think feeling that anything is worthy of narrative and that, that any perspective can, can speak to us. Um, I know in um, A Room of One's Own, Wolf talks about the pressure of dumbness um, and the accumulation of unrecorded life. And in Kew Gardens, she takes that to quite an extreme in a sense. Uh, and in a wider sense, I feel that's perhaps something she, she was somewhat influenced by Mansfield too, in that Mansfield, you know, the, the wonderful way Mansfield evokes childhood and a child's perspective, um, that, that anyone can be a storyteller in the widest sense of the word. A anyone's life, anything's life, any object's life um, can, can be worthy of, of rich narrative scene. Mm, amazing. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't um, have begrudged uh, Mansfield had she been a little bit resentful uh, that Wolf basically took on her idea and went on to write this amazing piece. I mean, it does sound to me like she was the seminal influence um, in that and, and perhaps she was very generous um, in, in letting her. Own back, actually, because uh, Mansfield did write a short story, uh, a poem rather, uh, called Night Centred Stock, in mm. which uh, some of the ideas that she'd talked about uh, in relation to Garthington Manor's garden, they do come out in the poem. And one thing that really struck me on rereading the poem recently is there's a line in the poem where she asks whether uh, the moon is a virgin or a harlot. 
And we'd referred earlier to some of the gossip um, that could have got in the way of the friendship between Mansfield and Wolves. And one of the really potential sticking points in their friendship was when Wolf was purported to have referred to herself as the chaste and Mansfield as the unchaste during some kind of malicious gossip session. And I thought, oh, the virgin and the harlot, the chaste and the unchaste, there does seem to be some kind of resonance going on there. But yeah, there's definitely a point being made there, I think. <laughs> Kirsty, I want to come to you. Um, Mansfield famously said, we, we have got the same job, Virginia, and it really is very curious and thrilling that we should both quite apart from each other, be after so very nearly the same thing. Um, I find this both practical, beautiful, but subtly provocative. Um, it, kind of, it kind of acknowledges, um, you know, uh, their, 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 their similarities, but it also shows, I think, the difficulties of navigating that relationship and that same desire that they have. Um, what do you make of reading between the lines of that, Kirsty? Well, I think it goes back to this issue of influence, as you just said. Influence is a beautiful thing, you know, and for writers and artists, that sharing of ideas, that living in the imagination and talking about what you've seen there, this is part of what we do and who we are. I think that there is no question, going back to this issue of, of sharing and, and things that are picked up and used, this is going to go on in such a relationship. I'm editing the, with Delia D'Souza Carrere, the selected letters at the moment, we're highlighting all of Mansfield's relationships with artists, writers, musicians. It comes across time and time again that this is a mutually enriching practice. And I think that, you know, this, the, the issue of gardens, Mansfield had been writing about gardens since she was a girl, you know. I think that she could, she could, she could write about gardens in her sleep. So I think that to highlight this one issue as being something that we can once again, you know, point the finger at and say this, this may, be, may have been something between the two writers, I think, I think means that we lose the overall general perspective, which is that, as both women said when they met each other, we are after the same thing. Um, there was this question of form. What form is it? Uh, Mansfield asked of Prelude. As far as I know, it's my own invention. Wolf, the same year, is saying uh, to someone else completely unrelated, I think I'm going to have to make up a form for this kind of writing I want to make. Both of them wanted to explore the, the life of home, of domesticity, the quotidian, the everyday. They were doing this together. They were explorers even as they had separate issues, separate ideas and separate projects. Mm. I love the idea of them being co-explorers. Actually, that's a really nice way of phrasing it. Um, I mean, I could talk to you guys for ages. It's been such a wonderful, fascinating conversation. Um, but I'm going to have a look and see if we've got any audience questions for you. Um, yeah, there's a couple here. OK. Uh, what should we take from looking back at two ambitious women and friends in terms of how we change our habits and regards for each other as ambitious novelists in this age? Um, who wants to take that? Kirsty, do you want to take that? Oh, I think I've just kind of talked about it. I think it's an issue of an ongoing dialogue, an ongoing conversation, and at all points, upping the stakes and making the conversations more inclusive, um, to share ideas more freely, and to absent ourselves from the kinds of discussions that are hell-bent on gossip and division and malice. Lovely. Okay, here's a question. Why do you think Mansfield's work is or is perceived as more realist and less experimental than Wolf's? Um, I'm going to come to Emily on that. Um, I think because there's a perception that Mansfield's work is more accessible. Um, I think a lot of people who haven't even read Virginia Woolf already arrive at the first thing that they do try and explore with this idea that this is a very very challenging writer whose you know, work is very difficult to wrap your head around. Um, I think Mansfield doesn't really come with quite that same baggage, perhaps. 
Um, you know, perhaps we also have an idea that short stories, um, although this, this clearly isn't true, that short stories are perhaps a simpler form, you know, they're shorter, you know, perhaps if you are struggling with something, you can more easily reread it than, than a novel. Um, I think though to sort of, I think to think of it that way though is to really miss a lot of the depth mm -hmm. and the subtlety of Mansfield's writing. I mean, I first encountered Mansfield's work um, a little bit later than I think Kirsty was saying herself. I think I was like in my early twenties and I was at this time, I think I was starting to take writing more seriously as you know, a, a craft and something that I wanted to do. I'd always have this idea actually that I would like to be a writer, but this was the point when I was actually really getting down to the work on it rather than just thinking about it. And I found, you know, reading Mansfield's stories at that time, you know, extremely inspiring. And, you know, it really pushed my sense of, um, you know, what a short story could do. And also like how much staying power a short story could have. Like, yes, a short story can be short in length, um, you know, it might be over and done with, you know, you can sit down and read it on a whole, you know, in one sitting, it could be over and done, with, you know, in as little as sort of five or 10 minutes in the case of some stories. But good short stories, you'll keep coming back to them and you'll keep, you know, um, rereading them in different ways, um, and which I think is, is definitely something that the best of Mansell's work, well, you know, Mansell's work as a whole certainly does. I wonder Brilliant. if it's down to the difference between short stories and novels too because obviously a short story can make demands of its readers um, in a sense that um, a reader can come to a short story and feel this is an experiment. This is something very different from anything I've read before, but I, I can give it a chance beca because of the brevity. Um, whereas obviously something like The Waves, where we have an experiment that is extended and that challenges us over many hours, days, weeks, potentially, of reading. That's a, a different kind of contract with the reader, I think. And, and quite possibly had Mansfield lived, she would have written work that challenged the reader in that same way. Um, but as it stands, I think there are two differences. One is to do with form and the, the particular challenges of reading a novel that is written so very differently from the previous reading a reader might have encountered. And secondly, to do with the lifespan. So Wolf outlived Mansfield by a very long time. And it was after Mansfield's death that she wrote the novels that we remember her by and that we consider to be her most experimental. Yeah, I wonder if losing such an important friend really spurred her on and in its way, you know, to um, to be able to create that work, having absorbed as much as possible from from that friendship, but also perhaps to honour it as well, because um, she knows that her friend would have wanted her to go on and write better work. Um, so it's amazing that she was um, able to do that. Um, so we have a question here um, for myself and Kirsty. When you write a short story, how do you build it into a full collection with others? Do you start with an idea for the collection or with a single story? Kirsty, do you want to answer that first? Oh, I was going to ask if you might like to. Yeah, oh, I can. I can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I have so many um, ideas buzzing around in my head. Um, I think I just start um, with just getting the story down. And um, something I'm interested in is, is the theme of transformation. Um, I think both consciously and subconsciously. So somehow... Um, a lot of the stories I, ha I write have that connecting underlying theme. Um, so, you know, if I write, I don't know, maybe eight or seven stories uh, and, and then it feels like I'm working towards some sort of collection, I don't really um, get stressed out about whether or not the stories connect because I know that somehow, you know, you're picking up on themes in other stories, there's crossover and it kind of happens organically. Um, but um, uh, Emma, Emma was talking a little bit about the short form earlier. and I, I mean, I really love it. I think it's, I think it's undervalued. Um, I think it's a really rigorous form. And and I think it also helps greatly in terms of working on novels. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoy um, writing um, both forms. Uh, Kirsty, I'll come to you. Well, I wonder if it might be um, a question of time. As Emma was saying, there's this issue of a kind of concentration of feeling and experience mm -hmm. that we get 
in the short story and the expectation is set from the beginning because the reader has a contract with the pages, if you like. We know how much time is going to be invested as opposed to the novel where we can read by its spine how long we're going to be involved in that process. However, going back to what I was touching on before, to my mind as a writer and as a reader, I'm just very uh, engaged by the relation between the two genres. And I do think that what Wolf and Mansfield show us is that short stories, that kind of concentration of impression, that highlighted feeling, that sense of entering into an experience, this is something that can be um, revisited and remade and it can become something like a novel and it can also become something like a collection of short stories that are related and it can also be a collection of short stories that are separate and disparate. I think to, to imagine the form itself as giving us some kind of instruction as to how to create a really exciting kind of fiction that delivers us an experience rather than simply telling us a story. I think at that point, the two coalesce and cohere and we have something that's exciting and full of energy. Yeah, absolutely. It's such a dynamic, exciting form for me. Uh, and there are so many um, writers doing really interesting things with it. Um, Emily and Emma, I want to come to you um, again. Uh, your great friends, uh, a friendship I myself have been a little bit obsessed with, I have to admit. Um, you both curated the amazing Something Rhymed, which is this wonderful repository of female literary friendships. Um, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how you draw inspiration um, from Wolf and Mansfield in terms of your friendship. I mean, I know you've written about them, notably for the Paris Review. I read that. It was a wonderful piece. But yeah, I wonder if you could just touch on that briefly. Uh, Emily, I'm going to come to you. Um, so Emma and I have never said the sort of things to each other, either, either to each other or behind each other's back that we know. Um, Wolf and Mansfield are so, so famous for. Um, but I think we have actually learned quite a lot from their friendship. Um, in some ways, I think when we first started exploring that friendship, initially on, on the blog, Something Rhymed, and then in our book, A Secret Sisterhood, I felt this was a friendship that was very, very different from our own. Um, partly because of those sorts of comments, but also because there seemed to be some quite marked contrasts between the two writers. Um, particularly in terms of their, their, their personalities and um, certainly, you know, the, the, the friction that was very much part of the friendship is not really something that has particularly existed in, in my relationship with Emma, I'm, I'm glad to say. But as time went on, I thought actually there are some sort of similarities here, you know, right from the start off, writing has been pretty central to our friendship in a way that it was to, to these two, you know, um, you know, for many, many years, we've shared work with each other, we've run ideas by each other. It's, it's, it, there were other elements to our friendship, but the writing has always been quite a driving force, I'd say. So there's a similarity there. Um, I think something that, that I learned from them, though, is that rivalry and friction, the uh, friction, sorry, can, can be accommodated <laughs> into a friendship. Um, and never more was this uh, important than when we were working on a secret sisterhood, um, when, you know, I would say we had more, proper bus stops probably isn't quite the right word, that we certainly had more moments of friction when we were hammering out the final um, uh, stages of that book than we'd ever really had um, before. And be able to see that there were these two women who had come before us who had managed to negotiate um, to a great, much greater extreme as well, you know, um, arguments and, and, and uh, you know, disagreement into their friendship, I think was very helpful. I think it's only natural that there would be some bus stops considering you were working on a book together, you know, a very intense process, even for just an individual. Um, so I think that's perfectly natural. Um, how about for you, Emma? Yeah, one thing that um, Emily taught me, and I think that once we learned about Mansfield and Wolf, we sort of appreciated the huge importance of it, was the importance of honesty in a friendship. Now, Mansfield and Wolf aspired to be scrupulously honest, um, 
And in some ways they did achieve that. Obviously Mansfield wrote a review that was very honest um, about Wolf's work and she felt she had a moral obligation to be honest to her friends and about her friends. Um, but also there were obviously the, the backbiting that went on behind backs and the, the periods, for instance, you know, she hadn't actually told Wolf that she was going to review the work. Um, so it came as rather a shock when Wolf read it. Um, and that attempt to be scrupulously honest, although I would say Emily and I tried to do it in a slightly kinder way, um, has been hugely important. And if you're going to write with someone, which on this occasion when we wrote A Secret Sisterhood, uh, we obviously did, that that really comes to the fore. And so when we did have bus stops, as Emily referred to them, um, it, it was important that we could, you know, that we had the kind of friendship that allowed us to have these quite rigorous debates that we could disagree and that that was never gonna threaten the friendship. And in fact, really never, those, those bus stops never really left the study, did they? They were never things that kind of festered. And one of the things that Wolf said about um, female literary friendship that's always stayed with me was that in her, in her sort of wiser or more reflective moments, she understood that it was really absurd to think if she's good, then I'm not. Um, and so actually to be able to acknowledge and celebrate a female friend's talent and to not think that in any way that, why would that diminish yours? Yeah. Um, and to be able to acknowledge and celebrate that difference. And she also said um, whenever she was afflicted by jealousy, uh, she again, in her wiser moment, she realized that the only thing is to confess it. And I think that speaks to this sort of scrupulous honesty that if one feels jealous, one needs to investigate that. Why do I feel jealous? It's probably because my friend is doing something I admire, that they're, mm. they're achieving something in their work. If I'm jealous of the work, then I can learn from it. Um, and so I suppose we, we started off with this sort of sense of honesty and then through what Wolf and Mansfield did well, but also through their pitfalls, I think we learned a little bit about what that might actually mean in practice. Yeah, it's about being honest, like you said, but also elevating each other and allowing space for mistakes. I, I cannot imagine um, yours and Emily's friendships not surviving. <laughs> the bus stop because you know you are you are great friends um we've now come to the end of the session uh, thank you so much uh to our wonderful guests for such a robust fascinating conversation i don't know about you but it, it's given me a whole new appreciation for my female literary friendships uh, and it makes me just yeah want to connect with them even more so thank you for your fantastic contributions i'm going to hand over back to molly thank you so much irenison Emily, Claire and Kirsty, what a brilliant, challenging, bold and thoughtful way to end Dalloway Day 2021. A huge thank you to, to all our speakers and partners today, uh, including Kate Moss, Gemma Seltzer, Shahid Abari, Kabe Wilson, Mulberry School, Sushila Nasta, Alexander Bubb, Claire Wilcox and Ramesh Gunasekera. And of course, the wonderful speakers you've heard from this evening. We were very sad to have to reschedule our event with Deborah Levy and Merv Emery due to the family bereavement of one of our speakers and our thoughts are with them today too. Um, we'll be rescheduling the event with Lit Hub as soon as possible and everyone who's booked on for that um, will be contacted and their tickets will carry forward and, and there'll be another chance for you to book for that too when we're able to hold it. If you want more from all of today's speakers, which I imagine you certainly do, you can buy their books through the RSL on bookshop.org and support independent bookshops while you do it. So a thoroughly good thing all round. Um, if you want to come to more of our events, events just like this for free, please join the Royal Society of Literature. We're running a special Dalloway Day offer, which you can just about still get, uh, to give you 20% off membership using the code Dalloway, Day, Dalloway Member and 10% off our digital events pass using the code Dalloway Pass. And I think you can find that on all of our social media channels if you want to look it up later. Our next event, uh, the RSL's next event, is on Saturday this week, and you will get even more of the wonderful Irenison. 
Join us for an event co-curated with the Centre for Contemporary Culture in Barcelona as we release for the first time new commissioned writing and films from RSL President Marina Warner and RSL Fellows Sophie Collison, Sophie Collins and the wonderful Irena Sinakoji. Members, fellows and digital pass holders of the RSL can book through our website uh, and for public tickets you can book through the Centre for Contemporary Culture in Barcelona through their website, you don't need to find. A huge uh, thank you finally for this evening um, to everyone at the British Library, particularly B. Rowlett and John Fawcett, to Beth Gallimore at the RSL, mastermind of this year's Dalloway Day, and our producers, Unique Media, for making tonight possible. And to all of you for joining us and sending such wonderful questions. I hope that you've had as good a Dalloway Day as I have. And until next time, good night. Thank you. <laughs>